Hey, Bristol. How are you? You don't look so well. I'm worried about you. You're not breathing like a city should. Is there anything I can do? Do you inhale deep by the lakes of Chu Valley? Is this still of interest to you? There's a tightness in the chest of the city that really won't do. 300 died from it last year. We're in a state of emergency. This needs a serious review. Are you feeling all right? Because the rush hour pollution, the soot and the gas can't be good for you. I've counted your areas of illegal emissions and they're more than 42. The worst emissions are outside the children's hospital. It killed Ella Kissy. Don't let it take these children too. I know you can't handcuff the wind. I know you can't find the sun. I know you can't arrest the rain. But there's work here to be done. Air pollution is nothing new. From as far back as the Industrial Revolution, air pollution has plagued our towns and cities. Only recently, however, have we realised the severity of the health effects it causes and the scale of the issue. Last year, Bristol City Council put forward plans regarding clean air zones, which made it a key topic in the news and discussion. Before the COVID-19 outbreak, a new study revealed that every week, five people die prematurely in Bristol due to air pollution. COVID-19 has temporarily halved air pollution in Bristol, yet people are unsure if new plans will come into effect or if we will return to the levels of pollution we had before. Bristol City Council put forward plans for clean air zones, yet these plans have been delayed and little progress has been made. For some, this feels frustrating, especially as the council was legally required to address this issue in 2016 and plans were only proposed after legal action was taken. In the media and everyday life, air pollution is often discussed, but what actually is it and where does it come from? We spoke to Ender Hayes, a professor at the University of West England's Air Quality Management Resource Centre. Air pollution, as we traditionally think about it, is pollution that comes from uh, our various day-to-day -day activities. Um, so the traditional pollutants that we think about are uh, nitrogen dioxide, which comes from uh, predominantly from transport, and then things like particulate matter, which is very, very small particles, and they come from a number of sources like uh, solid fuel burning, like transport, like agriculture. Bristol, like most UK cities, um, has a problem with nitrogen dioxide and that issue is predominantly due to road transport. It's simply down to the number of vehicles on the road and the distances those vehicles are travelling. We have this new emerging issue, if you like, of um, uh, PM10 coming from solid fuel burning. Uh, so again, this is particles that are being emitted uh, by wood burners in particular. Um, so on cold winter nights, uh, you particularly see a, a spike in those sort of uh, pollutants. There's a lot of traffic going in and out of Bristol, but does this really matter? Every vehicle that burns petrol or diesel produces harmful pollutants. The most dangerous pollutants are nitrogen dioxide and particulate matter, like soot. There's two types of particulate matter that we consider, PM10 and PM2.5. These are both small enough to enter deep into your lungs and into the bloodstream, causing all sorts of problems. We are now starting to realise that this has deadly implications for human health. To find out more, we spoke to Dr Victoria Stamford, an expert on the matter. She's part of MEDACT, a network of healthcare professionals who strive to protect healthcare within communities. So air pollution is what we call in the medical community a silent public health emergency. So we feel that um, the impact of air pollution is really from, from cradle to grave. So it will affect people before they're born, it will affect them in early life, all the way through their, their, their midlife, all the way till they're, till they're elderly. And it affects people in a wide range of ways. It reduces lung capacity, particularly in children who live in very highly polluted areas. There are studies that show that it reduces lung function by around 20%, which of course then has a huge impact on that child's healthy lung development, increasing the likelihood that they'll have asthma, increasing the likelihood that they'll have other respiratory problems later on in life. So it's increasing the amount of strokes, increasing the amount of cardiovascular disease, increasing the amount of heart attacks. It has negative effects on pregnancy and can have um, severe impacts on adverse uh, birth outcomes like low birth weight, premature birth. So really when we think about air pollution it's not just the, the respiratory illnesses, it's really it's, it's across the lifespan. 
um, and it affects all systems in the body. As we found out, there are more and more worrying effects related to this public health emergency, affecting people from before they are born and throughout their whole life in a wide range of ways. This can reduce children's lung capacity by around 20%, which has a huge impact on children's development. It increases the likelihood of cancer, asthma, strokes, cardiovascular disease, heart attacks and more. It has negative effects on pregnancies, causing low birth weight and premature birth. It's not just breathing illnesses, it affects all systems in the body. We're here at the Downs on a cold Wednesday morning. In my hand is an air pollution monitor that will test the key pollutants. We're going to go all around the city on our bikes and see the difference between the air quality in each area. Join us. Air quality monitors are inexpensive and can be easily bought online. Although this is not a scientifically accurate test, we hoped it would give us an insight into how different areas are affected. Our findings showed that the highest points of pollution were when we stopped in traffic on a busy road and that pollution was much lower when we went off main roads or into green spaces. Our highest levels were recorded in Lawrence Hill, an area that sees lots of traffic in and out of the city, yet residents are less likely to own vehicles here than in other areas. International Clean Air Day is held each year to help raise awareness for the problems of air pollution and the different ways that people can work towards making the air cleaner. We've come here to meet some activists taking action into their own hands. Ultimately, when there are the lives of 300 Bristolians at risk through toxic air pollution, then we all need to take some individual action, as well as asking the council and the government to take collective action. People are concerned, um, not just for their own health, but mostly I think for their children's health. Instead of driving to the shop, walk to the shop. Yeah, walking boots on. Yeah, walk your walking boots on. We don't want to sleepwalk into a public health emergency, which we, we might do if we, unless we start doing things now. Parson Street in Bedminster is a very busy route in and out of Bristol, making it one of the most polluted locations in the city. Parson Street Primary School, which teaches over 450 children, is located a stone's throw away from this busy street. We met up with a parent and a teacher to hear how they are combating the problem. Hello, I'm Kat. Um, I'm a mum here at Parson Street School um, and I am uh, the driver of this bike. Could you please tell us a bit how you feel about the air pollution in the area and how it affects you? I feel quite frightened about it, quite um, worried about it for my kids and for me and my family. It became more of an issue to me when my daughter started at this school and I was aware that it was by big main roads. It's really lovely to feel like we're not part of the problem, um, that we're promoting alternative ways. You know, we get a lot of attention with it, so people ask questions and we've got fit through it as well, which has been good. Ultimately, we want to put some of the responsibility back onto our school community. We contribute to this air by choosing to drive. So the idea is to turn it back to the kids and get the kids to be working towards um, coming up with their own solutions. That's what's going to make a difference, ultimately. We're in Porthcourt in South Wales to meet Stefan Rich, who moved here from Bristol last year with their son Cyrus. Cyrus suffers from serious health problems that they believe Bristol's air pollution contributed to. We lived in Bristol for a long time. I was there for 20 years and Rich was there 37 years. We had a baby in 2011 and we love Bristol, it's brilliant, uh, but our child developed asthma when he was about three, maybe two. Where we were was uh, St Paul's, St Agnes, which is very close to the M32. So when we walked into school, we had to walk across major roads or under the M32 J3. And we were becoming more and more aware that his health was getting affected. We could feel it ourselves. He also had a heart condition, which bad air doesn't help with. Yeah, and it didn't help that the trees that were literally behind our house despite having a TPO on them, were cut down a year later to make way for another development in the city. So we started looking into moving somewhere that was more rural with cleaner air, but that we could still enjoy living in.
Bristol City Council announced controversial proposals for a charging zone and diesel ban after the government called on cities to cut pollution levels. No one from the council was able to speak with us on the matter. However, we spoke to Jerome Thomas from the Green Party. In November 2016, my Green Councillor colleagues introduced a motion to clean up the city's air, including introducing clean air zones. Since then, we're really disappointed at how slow progress has been. Other councils have moved ahead much faster than Bristol in cleaning up their air. Birmingham and London both have clean air plans either in place or ready to go. And that's exactly the kind of shift that we'd like to see in Bristol. Central government has promised £250 million to local councils for COVID-19 interventions, enabling safer walking and cycling. Brand new council proposals have been unveiled, which include pedestrianising the old city, walking and cycling improvements, and introducing bus priority routes. Another promising new council-led scheme, Bristol School Streets, aims to improve the air quality and environment around schools by reducing traffic, improving road safety and encouraging walking, scooting and cycling to school. It's clear that to address this problem, governments and councils must take affirmative action. However, it's equally up to us as individuals to do our bit. This could mean trying to drive less, using more public transport, cycling or using your wood burners less. We've seen our air clean up due to COVID-19. Could this be an opportunity to stop the pollution from returning? Anything that can reduce the volume of vehicles on the road and anything that can reduce uh, the amount of miles travelled uh, will only have a positive effect. I would love it if the government and local councils could make bigger steps to challenge air pollution. It's a man-made issue and it's something that we can address and actually reducing the amount of road transport coming into Bristol is really what we need to be doing. And we need to improve our public transport so people can get around the city in a way which is sustainable and is in line with the vision for Bristol being a low carbon city. Of encouraging people to use public transport, encouraging people to walk and cycle, basically encouraging people to, uh, to get out of their cars. Making people aware of the tiny little bit that they think they're contributing, changing that with a tiny little behaviour change, that, that's what's going to make a difference ultimately. To educate people that uh, you're actually better off on a bike or walking or scooting. There's no silver bullet. There is no one solution that's going to solve all of our problems. And like I mentioned, different cities and different areas will have different challenges, not just in the UK, but across Europe and across the world. Smart not bad buzz fleet, instead of these old diesel vehicles, get some electric vehicles in. Technology will help, we will see cleaner fuels, we will see cleaner um, vehicles and cleaner engines coming along, but technology alone isn't going to fix it. We need this blend of both technological improvement with kind of societal and behaviour change. This is something that can be done and I think that's something that, that people need to know. 